Hello, my name is Katie Goodsall, but some people refer to me as the Gravestone Girl because I like cemeteries and I'm a data nerd. It's a pretty good icebreaker, right? I love introducing myself to people with my nickname because it usually gives me some sort of reaction along the lines of, huh, well that's different, but that's good because it usually gets them thinking about something they're not thinking about, possibly how cemeteries and data combined. And they're probably also wondering why I'm so proud of such a dark nickname. Well, it may not be as dark as you may perceive, because cemeteries and gravestones are awesome. And as far back as I can remember, I've always had a fascination with cemeteries and gravestones, and it started when I was a child. My parents were actually the reason that I started to love cemeteries, because we used to go visit historical cemeteries in East Sandwich, Massachusetts, up on the Cape every summer. And they would amazingly entertain my idea of wanting to go sit and take photographs and read all of the gravestone carvings for literally hours on end. And they also taught me that cemeteries don't have to be creepy. They can be beautiful. And that death doesn't have to be as morbid as it normally is portrayed. It can be science. And sometimes pop culture just gets it wrong. For instance, if I walk through a cemetery day or night, I'm not anticipating to see a vampire run by me after his or her next victim. Nor do I anticipate a zombie hand coming out of the ground ready to grab my ankle for dinner. But on the contrary, I visit cemeteries for their historical knowledge and stories carved in stone that celebrate one's life. They're places that are full of information hidden in plain sight that data nerds, like myself, can see an interesting historical and cultural data that can show us how life was like eras ago without even opening a textbook. Think about it for a moment. Cemeteries are outdoor museums where I can walk up and touch history with the own palm of my hand, knowing that someone years ago carved that gravestone with their own hands and tools. I can't touch history at the Louvre, can I? I mean, I can, <laughs> but it probably won't end well for me. But I can walk up to a historical person's gravestone and know that there's only about six feet or so between us. It's really powerful. And this became really evident during my undergraduate studies at Western Connecticut State University when I was starting to do my quantitative and qualitative research as an anthropology student. I had no idea what I was going to research until one day I stumbled upon a familiar place. It was unexpected, but familiar, at the old burying ground in Fairfield, Connecticut, when I stumbled upon this gravestone. This is Sarah Osborne, an 18-year-old who died 265 years ago. She clearly has no idea that I exist, nor does she have any idea that the real reason I stumbled across her gravestone was because I wasn't paying attention where I was walking. I was a typical 18-year-old millennial 10 years ago that walked directly into a low tree branch that you can actually see above that gravestone, and I narrowly missed landing on Sarah's gravestone in my fall, dropping my cell phone and a very delicious strawberry donut in the process, which is sad. And as I dusted off my jeans grumbling, I noticed something upon her gravestone. She died the same age as me. Suddenly, I didn't care about my phone or the donut. I cared about her. Who was she? Why did she die at my age? What was her story? And any passerby could read her gravestone and learn the basic knowledge that I learned that day as well. Sarah Osborne was born June 28, 1735, and she died July 2, 1753. She was the daughter of Lothrop Lewis, and she was the wife of Seth Osborne. And that's it. That's all you'd ever learn about her if you just referred to her gravestone. But that wasn't enough for me. Questions ran through my head. Did she know how to read and write? What was her life like? What was her favorite color? Did she like broccoli? When I stood up from her gravestone and looked around the remainder of the cemetery, I had an urge to walk to the next gravestone and learn about them. So I did. I walked to the next gravestone, and the next one, and the next one, to the point where I was getting frustrated because so many people died around my age. And then my thesis question arose. If she died so young, how many others did too? And as I whispered this question, I realized that cemeteries are more than just places of rest. They also hold data, data that I can analyze, data that could possibly answer that question that I asked. And cemeteries, they aren't dead. They're very much still alive. Thus began my journey of becoming the gravestone girl. For the next three years, I set off on my my research and my analytical research throughout Fairfield County, Connecticut by visiting 20 towns, 159 cemeteries, and manually categorizing just under 14,000 gravestones in search to see if more than 50 people buried between the Georgian and Victorian eras, so from 1714 to 1901, had died before the average age of 42, which is very young. 
and I wanted to prove that gravestones can be a data set if they're preserved, and I basically lived in cemeteries almost every day for the remainder of my studies. And my process was fairly simple. I walk through each cemetery in each town, and I take photographs of each gravestone in these two eras. Sometimes this could take a few hours or days, depending on how big the cemetery was, hint the farmer's tans. And I'd then I'd upload my data and start calculating. This is about where I became a data nerd, because data could tell me stories, and I love that. But what data am I talking about? Well, each gravestone holds a very particular set of data. Sometimes they can lead me down roads where they have names, and I can tell what gender the person is. They also list if the birth or death date, if I can't calculate the average age of death. Or they say if they're wife, husband, son, daughter, father, then I can analyze that later. Or they also have artwork on them, such as the photos you're seeing behind me. And if I can't tell what age that they died on, I can use their gravestone artwork to kind of guess where that gravestone was carved and what year. And what's amazing also is I can look at the wear on a gravestone. Looking at the wear is really important. And I usually mark down any wear that was on the stone because stone stones wear quicker, even though they are a hard substance. Sandstone can wear quicker than, say, granite or other possibilities like limestone. But when they're preserved and they aren't preserved, though, this can happen, unfortunately. The photo on the left-hand side was taken eight years ago, and the photo on the right-hand side was taken about a month and a half ago. This is Sarah's mom's gravestone. And when we don't preserve some of our oldest cemeteries and grave graveyards, records may be lost. Because prior to the mid-1800s, we didn't keep civil records, which is birth or death or marriage dates, such as Huckleberry Hill Cemetery in Brookfield, Connecticut, where some of the gravestones were ordered to be moved, but not the graves themselves. The majority were laid to rest with just stone and had no other record. If cemeteries hadn't been recorded or cataloged, and the gravestones are worn down or broken or hidden beneath soil, we may never know who was buried there. But preserved, we can actually calculate data and analyze it to see what is carved in the stone, giving us a better picture of how the world was like if we zoom out and look at one cemetery, or in my case, we looked at 159 cemeteries. And when we look at the gravestones per year, this is actually sorted by death year, we can see a really interesting trend. This shows us that Fairfield County started off with a less death, which makes sense, since as towns we start with a less population. And then as death starts to boom, the population grows, since we don't live forever, as we know. And as we know, the more the population grows, the more we need to have better places to bury our loved ones, which is why we have more cemeteries than graveyards. Did you know that a graveyard can typically be a cemetery, but a cemetery may not be a graveyard? Graveyards are usually associated with religious housings or communities, and the burial plots sometimes are scattered because we bury people once they die. While cemeteries are a bit more planned and organized, because as we started to grow quickly in population, we needed an orderly place to bury our loved ones. This growth can actually be attributed to the mortality rates, especially at certain ages. And when we order that same amount of gravestones by age of death, we can see an interesting trend. If you made it to about 20 years old, you did pretty well. But the younger you were or the older you were, Unfortunately, it was the highest amounts of death. And then once you see a little bit more of a median age, it's kind of amazing. You can in look into a little bit deeper. When we look into both eras, the Victorian era had a higher death rate, around 56 years old. But when we look at the Georgian era, it was 41, which is still underneath the average age of mortality. But when you actually look at both of the data sets between the Georgian and Victorian era, when you break down to just people who died under the age of 42, 19 years old was the median age of death for both eras, right around Sarah's age. Which brings me back to my original thesis question. The overall both eras showed that less than half of the percentage did die. But during the same era that Sarah died, the Georgian era, 50% did die over the average age. But this asked me more questions, right? I'm a question person, if you haven't already guessed. I wanted to see what else was going on. I succeeded in retrieving my overall question for my thesis question, but I'm wondering why would people die so young? So I decided to look at variables such as gender, marriage, disease, seasons and months, and towns that people were buried within to see if maybe they would give me a little bit more additional answers. And when we lay out the percentages per town of people that died under the age of 42 years or younger, I'm interested to see that the majority of the highest mortality rates were in cities and not towns. Could this be because there's more population, and if disease were to occur, it'd be easier to spread? Could be many factors. Gender-wise, it was very intriguing as well. We can see that more women passed away 
42 years or younger, unfortunately. And while in the Victorian era, we actually tied male and females were at 50%. Five females, unfortunately, winning by 13 deaths. We were almost there, ladies. <laughs> and when I look at genders, I wonder, did marriage play a toll? Only 18% of the gravestones that were cataloged stated that they were married. So within that 18%, I could see that 21% of the people that died under the age of 42 lived a longer lifespan. So maybe marriage did play an effect on life longevity. Possibly if someone became sick, there was someone there to care for them. There was also more financial stability and family. And then I wanted to break it down based on seasons to see if that would be intriguing. When we look at the seasons and months of death, it makes sense that we have a higher amount of deaths during the colder months. But during the summer months, there's hardly any deaths. And then I said, you know, I want to revisit the gender thing again with seasons. So when I break out based upon gender, we can see an interesting trend. Male and females carried along the same timeline for both eras for the majority. But in February, in both eras, it dramatically swaps. Is it possible that deaths are higher during that month for females because of childbirth? As we look at the lowest amounts of deaths in the summertime, where conception would occur possibly in June for a February birth, or did more people die in the colder months from illness? So I decided oh, I'm going to look at diseases. To analyze illness, I did research about diseases that spread throughout New England and Connecticut during these two eras. And there were a good amount of diseases and epidemics that were cataloged because we're prior to modern technology. In 1728, there was an epidemic of pleurisy in Newtown in February. And in 1760, there was an outbreak of smallpox in December. And when we lay over our original gravestone chart, underneath some of the years that there were diseases, we can see some of the largest spikes were also years that these occurred. It could be a contributing factor. But wait, 1753, there was an outbreak of dysentery which is the inflammation of intestine from bacteria when you eat or ingest uh, food or water that had fecal matter. That's interesting. 1753, though, where have we heard that year before? Oh, Sarah died that year. Okay. So when I did a bit more research, this information came up. There was indeed an outbreak of dysentery within New England and within Fairfield County, Connecticut, where Sarah lived, during June and July of 1753. This epidemic apparently took people by surprise, since epidemics usually happen during the colder months. Alongside another female resident from Fairfield, Elizabeth Rowland, who was buried in the same cemetery as Sarah, passed away at the average age of 27, just 16 days after Sarah. And it was documented that she died from dysentery, where two to three people were buried in Fairfield, Connecticut, per day. Is it possible that we just found out how Sarah died by looking at gravestones and the data that we combined from it and researching? It is indeed possible because gravestones can be a data set. And after presenting my, to my peers all my data during my senior year of my undergraduate career, I wanted to hop back up on stage and tell people about 100 people that I had discovered and learned about during this process, including Sarah, the girl that started it all. And that even though I just told you about mortality rates and what was the most interesting thing was the people themselves and how we can learn about history from their gravestones. Sarah's story, just like many others, can be unwoven by looking at her gravestone and the ones around her. This is Sarah's family tree. And even though Sarah only lived for 18 years, she led an interesting life and so did her family. We learned that four people in her immediate family died before the average age of mortality. We also learned that three people in her family were named Sarah, a very popular name. Her mother was married twice. Sarah had a child outside of wedlock with Seth Osborne, whom she lay married soon afterwards. And he remarried after she passed away to a woman named Mabel. And they had a daughter named, you guessed it, Sarah. And unfortunately, during all this process, I didn't find out what her favorite color was or if she liked broccoli yet. <laughs> but what did I just tell you? I told you about someone's life. I barely scraped the surface of it. But really, I also relay data to you, data that I learned from a cemetery because I decided to read a gravestone. This is data that needs to be preserved for future generations, and there's really easy ways to do it and to get involved. Visit a cemetery. It's as simple as that. Read a history that surrounds you. Enjoy a walk and pick up some trash, too. Visit a local historical society and learn how you, too, can preserve gravestones and sometimes help record gravestones, just like I did, and their wear and tear. And finally, become a gravestone nerd by learning and reading. And I hope to encourage how cemeteries are really amazing places by writing a young adult novel named Bones and Drones and a coloring book, 
as well to show kids that cemeteries aren't scary. They can be awesome. Gravestones are amazing forms of artwork. They're historical timetables and data collectors located above residents that walked the land before us. But that isn't their story. That's just the beginning. Thank you. <laughs>